I'm here to talk to you today about this frame, the Power Q. Incredible frame. I want to give you a little bit of a backstory before I go into the build process. My name is Rick. I'm the founder of Southeast FPV, and many of you know me as SS Belmont in the multi GP race community. We've been testing this frame design and iterating on it for the entire 2019 multi GP race season, including racing it all the way up through nationals in both pro and sportsman class, along with several top elite pros competing on this frame as well. I won't name any names, but we'll just say that one of the top 16 was flying this frame. And I personally have been flying it for the whole season, as well as many other members of the Quad Rivals Racing Team. So let me get into the details. This frame has a place for everything you can imagine, including your RX, your TBS antenna, uh, SMA connectors, your Crossfire, etc. There's a very discreet location for each and every item. First thing I want to point out is the Crossfire antenna holder. Intentionally it was designed to be placed here with the RX right behind it there as you can see. We have all sorts of TPU parts for the frame as you can see here. I have a flip strap. I also have a 45 degree FPV mount as well as an SMA, TBS SMA adapter in the rear. By default, the frame was shipped with a variable FPV mount as well as a TBS SMA mount. We also have a calf holder that attaches to the rear standoff, 10 millimeter standoff. Let me take a moment to talk about the SMA holder here. The TPU holder for the SMA is slotted so it fits nice and snug inside of the TPU part. Here's another angle so you can better see how it fits in the slot. Let's get right into the build process. Take a look at the package. Comes pre-packaged just like this. You have your four motor mounts here. Your hardware in this package. Top plate, mid plate, bottom plate. Side braces, front and rear braces. And you have your dual motor mounts. We'll get into these a little later. This is a very special item. No other box frame on the market is using this approach. It provides a ton of rigidity, as well as your forearms here. These arms are designed in a special way, which I'll talk about that in a moment as well. So let's get right into it. So the first thing we want to do here is we want to remove the two side braces and the two front and rear braces from the package. Next, we want to assemble the box portion of the frame. So we have the box built here, and I want to make a few comments on a couple of items. So when designing a box frame, it's extremely important for you to get your tolerances as tight as possible, but without the need to hammer uh, the parts into place. So, and the only real accurate way to do that is you got to really work with your factory over a period of time. And there are uh, variants and tolerances due to the carbon fiber thickness. I'm not going to get into the variation because it can vary from factory to factory and carbon fiber to carbon fiber, but I've been able to find a nice uh, compromise in terms of what provides a tight fit and what provides a loose fit and what provides uh, uh, the most adequate fit. Uh, so with that in mind, let me show you. We have the box built. As you can see, it's, it's not coming apart. What that tells you is that the fit is not loose. Actually, it's just perfect. So we'll move on to the next phase. And for that, we're going to need what we call the two dual mounts. You can see how they snap into place. What that should tell you is that it's a really good fit. The tolerances are perfect. And so you can see the frame is holding itself together with no bolts. Tolerances are exceptional. So now you have a majority of the box built. The next phase is we're going to take our four inner arms here. And these arms are designed in a special way. I want to comment on those in a second here. So let me show you these arms here. They're all symmetrical. They'll work front or rear. 
take a, a note, make a, a, a note of the arm. There is an angled uh, tip here, and there's a pretty blunt squared off tip here. The purpose for this is some motors have uh, bolts, uh, in particular the T-motor bolts. They protrude down past the base, uh, the motor base, and they can essentially, where you have your mount hole here, they can rub on this piece here. And I like to use three interconnecting points uh, because it provides a more stable frame. Uh, some frames you'll see there will only be two locking mechanisms. I highly discourage that for you designers out there that are designing box frames. I think it's uh, important to have those three connection points as we've, we've been through multiple iterations of these things and it works really well. Um, so anyways, this angle piece here, if you do have a motor bolt that protrudes below the base, you want to run with this point forward. That will give you the necessary clearances so you don't have any rubbing of the base here. If you flip it over and run it this way on a T-motor, the bolt could rub right here and you could fix that by filing it down. But what I've done to compensate for that is to put a little angle on this piece here and all you have to do is flip the arm upward and place it in the dual mount like so. So I'm going to cut to that and I'm going to go ahead and attach these four arms to the two dual mount plates. So this is what the frame looks like after you've attached all four of your arms here. And the next step is to take your four smaller motor mounts and attach those to the frame. So ideally we typically like to run the dual motor mount on the top of the frame. Uh, but we do have some guys that are running on the bottom. You can do it either or. The frame is pretty much symmetrical, although it is um, pretty much a stretch X, but the parts are identical. The forearms are the same, and the two side braces are identical. The two front and rear are identical. So, next we're going to place the motor mounts on the frame like so, and they should snap into place as well. There is a specific direction that they need to go, so if it looks like it's not aligning properly, just flip it. And you can see how that snapped right into place. On a lot of these box frames, either the tolerances are going to be so tight uh, that you have to file. or. They're going to be extremely loose. Okay, at this point, we've applied the four last uh, motor mounts here. And a couple of things I want to point out here our tolerances are, are fairly accurate, but due to the fact that some carbon fiber, the variances um, can be anywhere between, um, for example, two millimeter carbon fiber, can vary anywhere between 2.2 in terms of its thickness down to say 1.8, 1.9-ish. Uh, in our case, our factories are pretty consistent at the 2.0 to 2.1 to 2.2 uh, variance. I've been working with them long enough and, and they really focus on that because they know my frame is very dependent on tight tolerances. And so what I want to point out, if you have a part that does fit a little too tight and that can happen, it's pretty rare with our frames, but I can tell you it can happen. What you want to do is just file out a little bit of some of these areas here. But on this frame here, everything just snapped right into place. And I just want you to see this. There are no tools holding this frame together whatsoever. And you can see that I'm able to hold this frame, shake it, move it. It's not falling apart. So for the next step, what you want is the bottom plate. And then the mid plate here. So let me explain a little bit about why I like to use a style of a design on a box frame. So I'm not a big fan of the arms connecting to the top plate. Uh, that does result in a lot of vibrations. And as a result, it can lead to a, qu a quad that's extremely hard to tune. And so the concept that I've come up with is to use 
a type of squeeze plate that you'd see in a traditional design. So if you were thinking about a traditional design, and let's just say these were five millimeter arms and you turn them uh, at a 90 degree angle, what you would find is uh, you'd have a top and a, and a bottom squeeze plate in most cases. So what this void allows us to do here is to place the ESC below the mid plate. And this gives you a lot of uh, possibilities and a lot of room to work with. Literally, you can use a 30 by 30 build and you can get your stack height above the mid plate all the way down to uh, 10 millimeter standoffs. In some cases, you could go as low as um, you know, 10 to 15 is what I would say, is about as low as you want to go. But the hardware that we ship with this frame uh, ships 20 millimeter standoffs. It also ships 10 millimeter standoffs to go between the two squeeze plates. It's not a requirement to use the 10 millimeter spacers. Some of our guys like to use the nitro fuel line, cut the size, but the 10 millimeter spacers will make it more rigid. So here I have a Hobby Wing 40 amp 20 by 20 ESC. It's been pre-prepped and as you can see here I have four MR30s soldered on. Um, we like to run MR30s. It does add uh, maybe a couple grams or so to your build but the purpose for this is you can have hot swap motors which I mean literally you can swap a motor out in a minute uh, you know a matter of 15-20 seconds literally so if you're at a race it's extremely important. Um, it doesn't add enough weight for it to be much of a noticeable difference. So therefore, you know, all my builds you're going to see MR30s on them. And most of the guys on the Quad Rivals team run that same type of setup. So let me show you this after I've mounted it here. And I'll give you a few tips and tricks on how we like to set things up. Okay, so you can see the ESC here. And I have it installed. And normally we like to run a nitro fuel line for spacing and it's really easy to cut it's uh, inexpensive and what you do is you just cut it to length or you can print a TPU spacer or you can use whatever spacer uh, you prefer to space it in so as you can see here I have it installed and you can see the clearance that I have and typically that's about the size of the spacer that I'd want to create and once I have that spacer in place then I can put a small nylon nut here or I can use another space of my choice and install my flight controller at that point. So once you have uh, this configured this way, you can go ahead and complete your build uh, with these. So I'll just show you quickly. So you can see I have the ESC and the mid plate uh, snapped into place now. And if I have my spacers in there, you could see that I have plenty of room here to run multiple straps if I'd like. I just run one. Sometimes if I'm having issues with batteries ejecting, I'll run two straps in here. Okay, so here we have our four 20 millimeter standoffs, followed by 18 millimeter button head bolts, followed by 10 millimeter standoffs, followed by, there should be four here, but there are five, uh, six millimeter bolts. Okay, you can see that we've attached or installed the four 18 millimeter bolts followed by the 10 millimeter standoffs. And like I said, these are somewhat optional. Um, most of my guys use uh, nitro tubing cut to length. It's a bit easier to uh, replace, faster to work on, but this does make it a little more rigid between the bottom plate and the mid plate. And again, these are 10 millimeter in length. So I'll cut to the next phase of where I installed this on the frame. And next, we're gonna install the four 20 millimeter standoffs. Okay, so now we've installed the four 20 millimeter standoffs. Next, all we have to do is install the top plate with the four six millimeter bolts that we have here. Here we have it, the complete build. As you see, I have the top plate installed. And that's it. This frame is super stiff. I love the design, very flexible, easy to work on.